every time there's a new thing in human history, people resist. I wish they wouldn't, but they do. Robert Scoble has been a pillar in Silicon Valley for more than three decades, providing strategic insight and advice for some of the biggest tech companies on the planet, including Microsoft. We get into a wide range of topics, the existential threat of artificial intelligence on American jobs. These things are going after our jobs, let's be honest. Uh, you know, if you have a job driving a car today, you're not gonna have a job in 20 years. We analyze the AI war between China and the United States of America. Let's say uh, no more AIs, uh, stop buying Nvidia cards, can't do any model building. No, we've got to slow that down. Uh, China's not thinking like that. They just spent $40 billion on their semiconductor industry. How Apple's spatial computing will totally change the way we interact in both our bedroom and the boardroom. Apple has a new radio network that nobody knows about called Ultra Wideband. And that can let your glasses talk to the M1 in your Macintosh that I'm talking to you on. And for fun, we analyze who would win in an AI race between Elon Musk and Steve Jobs. He's the only person who got Siri. He uh, bought the first AI app. All right. I am thrilled to welcome Robert Scoble to some future day. Robert has been a pillar in the technology community as a strategic thinker, mind, and well ahead of the curve for over three decades. Robert, my first question to you is this. Why does it seem like every time new technologies are brought out, there's a certain type of resistance that we experience as business people, politicians, the media, there's always like a resistance to new technologies, Robert. So what do you, yeah. where's that from? And, and do you even agree? Like, are, are we going through this resist time where there's resistance again? Yes. Every time there's a paradigm shift, uh, people resist. Uh, and mostly it's, they resist change. New technology, new ideas, new thinking represents new work for them. And most people don't like to do extra work. <laughs> they don't right. like to study new things. They don't like to consider new things. They don't want to, you know, if they work in a factory, they don't want to rip up their their workstation and do things a different way. And they certainly don't want to lose their job. So there's a lot of resistance there. There's a lot of fear about AI right now because of that. Do you think that resistance is a, a global phenomenon? Oh, yeah. I've been in 70 different countries and, and you hear the same resistance worldwide. In some places, it's worse, actually. In Silicon Valley, at least we know, you know, hey, there's a you know, if you change, there's companies that spring up and there's, you know, there's good stuff that comes with that. But around the world, most people don't have Silicon Valley in their backyard. So they, you know, their parents tell them, oh, go, go get a real job. You don't start a startup, you know, stuff like that. And, and so you hear a different kind of resistance around the world that you wouldn't hear here in Silicon Valley. But here in Silicon Valley, every time, you know, a new email tool comes out, people are like, why do we need to use email? I, uh, you know, I, I'm old, so I remember the days before email. <laughs> me too, me too. I tell stories about when I was in law school, we had an email system that we can only use within the law school. And then yeah. when I left law school, I kid you not, Robert, I had to give my email, I had to return my email address and all of my emails. Can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> it's really dating True. myself a little bit. <laughs> no. So so on a global scale though, like in your experience and in your opinion, do you feel like the innovation worldwide is at a more than average pace than typical? It is right now because AI is making all the programmers more more efficient. Uh, many of them say it it sped them up by 50%. So, you know, something that used to take a month now takes two weeks. And in some cases, it takes a lot less than that, right? I've had many people say, man, it wrote a month's worth of code in an hour for me, you know? It's amazing. And, and because of that, you're seeing that speed up. But you're also seeing speed up because of the AI world. As the AI gets more data, they can use AI to do more things, right? And so 
you're seeing this whole industry just boot up. I have a tw- Twitter list or an X list of 1600 AI companies now that really didn't exist a year ago. And so it, this whole world is just springing up like uh, mushrooms after rain. Where are you seeing, other than in, in Silicon Valley and the United States, which regions of the planet are you excited about as it relates to innovation and growth, maybe as it relates to AI, but in general? There's three places that really you see a lot of innovation being done. Israel, because of its startup nation. And there's a lot of reasons that that happened. They generate more startups in Israel than any other country, and it's a far smaller country than any place else. And China uh, is, so- is something to work and watch, you know. But we don't have really that much uh, touch points with China, right? There, most of the startups there are going after their internal market, which is quite large. Um, but what, every once in a while, you'll see a DGI or a Insta360 kick out and try to build a, a global brand out of China. So It's interesting that you mentioned Israel. Like I told you, I, I was fascinated to um, learn about you. We did some research, and I think you had mentioned uh, that your, your grandfather was in Germany and was a brave man. In fact, I think he was very vocal against the Nazis. Yeah, he was arrested uh, for speaking out against the Nazis, right? But it, which caused a split in the family that continues to, to to this day, right? Because part of the family is like, "You're putting us at risk by doing this kind of speaking out and getting arrested, and we don't want to be on these people's uh, radar screen, right?" So it really caused a a rift in the family. But yeah, it, 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 my mom grew up in Germany and immigrated here, and so there. I got to see the, uh, I call it the German mafia, right? Because there's all these, in Silicon Valley, there's all these mafias. There's the Indian mafia, there's the Jewish mafia, there's the G- German mafia, there's a Muslim mafia. I just went to a Muslim AI uh, meetup. The other day. <laughs> you know, so it's really interesting, like the way that you're articulating all of these different mafioso. Oh, they run the place, man. So, so AI, so does... So it seems like AI really doesn't have any boundaries. And in a time where we're living, you know, it seems like culturally we're so split, we're so divided because of politics. Do you personally think that artificial intelligence can work to bring humans back together again, to unify us? You can ask ChatGPT or any of these large language models, uh, show me all points of view on X, on something, right? And it does. And that's positive, right? Because it shows you, you know, you can put a, a a political problem in there, like show me all points of view on abortion, right? And it it will it'll give you a holistic view. That's positive. But it could also take you down a rabbit hole and uh, uh, turn you more and more extreme, i.e. more and more toward the edges. And therefore, it, it could make our democracy worse in a lot of ways. So it's something that definitely to be aware of and watching because it, you know, it's, it's cold. It, it doesn't care about us really. It cares about laying down the next word. That's all it really cares about. Right. And it's really good at that. It's so good at that, that humans think it's a college essay. Right. But all it did was lay down a next word. You know? So, so you're really referencing um, LLMs then. Yes. Yeah. These new large language models right. that are the technology, the machine that's underneath like chat GPT or uh, Google Bard and stuff like that. Do you, do you think that will carry over that, that concept that you're talking about where I guess it doesn't understand um, bias and, and divisive types of statements? Will that carry over into other types of AI? Well, first of all, it, I mean, technically it doesn't understand anything other than laying down the next word. <laughs> so, right, right. Just to protect myself against all the AI people who are like, ah, this, you know, this is a machine that just knows how to lay down the next word. And it knows how to do that because it studied all human knowledge, right? It ingested all of that. It read my blogs for 20 years. It ingested that into this machine that's like a... Uh, a, a, a very complex machine with a trillion knobs on it. And the way you turn these knobs is to talk English to it. You, you actually program it with your own language. You can talk any number of languages to it, right? Um, yeah, these LLMs, uh, 
they do understand. I mean, if you ask them a question like, can you explain what kind of biases exist in AI like yourself? It answers the question and it does a very, very good job at that. It it does understand at, at some level because of how it was built. But it um, also ingested all of our human knowledge. So if you ask it, here's, here's an example. If you ask it... Um, Please show me. Please tell me about how Silicon Valley was started. It leaves the Chinese out, just like Leland Stanford left the Chinese out, because Leland Stanford pays all the historians to write the history. He wrote the history because he's the victor. He doesn't have to include the people he beat up. 1,300 people died building his transcontinental railroad, and then they weren't invited to the final party. They don't like to talk about that at Stanford University. They will if you ask them. And GPT is the same way. If you start asking them about the role of the Chinese, all of a sudden it gives you a different answer, right? But there was an original bias there in the first answer that, you know, it picked up from us. Right, and it, and that's a that's a, a egregious case, a big case. There's lots of little places like this where it picked up our biases from our society. By the way, this is going to be a tool that you use to find all sorts of things in society. Like I, I've used it to find a screw in a Lowe's. It knew where it was. Right, that's incredible. So. Did it pick up if you start asking it questions, like if you're a banker and you're using it to run your, your banking system, does it pick up your redlining that you used to do back in the 50s and 40s? Right. It could. So that's an interesting question then, because what you're talking about is, to a certain extent, maybe today during the early stage, the entity, and maybe this is also fueled a lot by venture capital and private equity, but the entity that wins at training these LLMs can also set the tone for our history and influence yes. people perhaps as it relates to government. You mentioned China, for example. Is China programming their LLMs to be communist or you know, themed around communism? Good. And then yeah. will the Chinese LLMs, because more people are training theoretically the Chinese LLMs, will they ultimately beat American trained LLMs? Yeah, it will if you want to learn how to make an electric uh, railroad. Because they have a thousand of them over in China. We don't have one yet in America. So how are we going to train an LLM to teach you how to build one of those? They could, right? So their, their LLM will have things that ours don't have. But I guarantee you there won't be any talk of Tiananmen Square in that LLM, right? They'll right. make sure that gets removed from any training data that they train their LLMs on. So if you're looking for accurate uh, historical analysis of what happened in Tiananmen Square, you're not going to use the Chinese one. You think that the Chinese government and the Chinese population is better than the Americans at, you know, building new structures. You, you mentioned the electric train, but I, I've been reading a lot in the space too, coincidentally. And I noticed that, you know, in, in a very short period of time, it seems like the Chinese could go in, build an entire train station, build a new building. And it takes us here in New York, 18, 24, 36 months to do a basic, a basic thing. I think the same thing's happening in California. So is China yeah. beating us on that front? Uh, Depends how you look at it, right? If you ask at all points of view, there's a, there's a pro view and an anti view. I visited China. I visited Shanghai back in um, 1995. And they took me up in the little TV tower that still is there and looks like a, a series of balls on a, on a tripod. And they said, look over there. And they had just completely... Uh, uh, tore down everything on this island. In other words, the island was flat. <laughs> and, they, and they said, we're going to put our Wall Street there. And they did in, in the last 20 years. Now, if you go to uh, Shanghai, uh, you, you see this huge uh, Wall Street with tall buildings, some of the tallest in the world, right? But they tore down a whole bunch of neighborhoods and they... Probably didn't go through a lot of public discussion like they would here in the United States, where you know you you know if you want to build a freeway through Los Angeles right now, you'd have to have thirty years of meetings 
with people to try to convince them that's a good idea. And then you'd have to do an eminent domain and go through the court process and all that. No, in China, they just filled in. They just t- tell you to move, <laughs> right? <laughs> and you have to. There's, there's a different political. So there's the, there's the laws, right? Like they might be more innovative as far as leveraging new technologies, speed to the market, but at whose, you know, at whose detriment, at the people's detriment. There's always a pro and a con to these things, right? And, you know, they do build things very quick. And I've talked to factory owners over there and they sort of make fun of our system. It's like, hey, you guys can't get anything done over there. We can build a factory, you know, you know, in a month. <laughs> right? yeah, it's incredible. I see it. I really see it. But Robert, like, is like in your opinion, is this this there's there are a lot of races that are happening in AI right now, right? Like domestically yep. here in the United States and US versus China. Like we've we all go through it. In your opinion, do you feel like the competitive uh, nature of an individual matters in these AI wars, or do you think it's all about? the funding and the money behind uh, these entities. There's a lot. I mean, I'm looking at a list of AI artists, about a thousand people using, you know, mid journey and uh, stable diffusion to create beautiful art, right? Those are individuals who are using AI to do something new that wasn't possible a year ago. So yeah, yeah, there, there's a lot of impact there. I mean, you, you see the money because the leverage that this gives a company is extraordinary. I mean, you see an open AI come out of almost nowhere and getting $13 billion from Microsoft to build a system that integrates into all the Microsoft tools, right? This large language model system. That gives them a lot of leverage that, you know, we haven't seen in the tech industry. And so the the funding events are getting extraordinary. You know, they're just unreal. I, I remember, you know, back in the old days, uh, this little startup called Color came out and they it got $41 million of investment and everybody in the Valley was outraged. It was like, that's so much money for a company that doesn't have a customer, doesn't have a, you know, a sales, right? And now that seems like a, a, a dime on the sidewalk compared to some of the funding events I've seen this year. But there, there's still some gaming, right? Like I, I remember you mentioned um, OpenAI. I think like Elon Musk came out a few months ago and said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Although I helped finance it, it seems like Microsoft is really controlling OpenAI now. And furthermore, I think because there's such a high risk with, with AI in general, everybody should put the brakes on development and figure things out. But is that like Elon just playing games and trying to catch up here and, 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 you know, the competitive spirit of Elon Musk in play? There's something to the existential threat. I, you know, I sat next to uh, one of the top AI safety researchers in the world for 10 hours on a plane trip last year. And he laid out, well, you know, yeah, it could go on a line. In fact, my my show's called on a line because of this conversation, right? It could go on a line. It could go anti-human. How would that happen? Well, the AI today is already better at seeing tumors and scams than a surgeon is. And a surgeon is our most highly trained human being there is. And if the AI is already beating the surgeon at, at his job or her job, uh, you know, you take that 20 years down the road, it's going to be better than us at a lot of things, maybe everything. So if it gets to that point, does it decide it doesn't need us anymore because it's better than us, right? It could go on a line. It could go anti-human. It could decide to turn us off in various ways and cause us problems, Ex- existential threat. I I get that. I, I, I think that... It, when, as we join with AI and as AI gets uh, smarter, uh, it's going to show us how to make sure that we build the guardrails so it doesn't do that. And there's lots of companies working on that. Anthropic, for instance, gives its AI a constitution so that it'll stay on task and not oh, go completely unaligned and do something anti-human. But there's a whole lot of other problems from joblessness uh, you know, because th- these things are going after our jobs. Let's be honest. Uh, you know, if you have a job driving a car today, you're not going to have a job in 20 years. In 20 years, it's going to be completely autonomous, our transportation system. So how is a human going to be driving a truck or a car? That doesn't make sense to me. So let's start talking about what kinds of policies we need to get people to be retrained, 
uh, give them a fair shot at the American dream again and, uh, and get them back. And, you know, it's, we should have a debate about, uh, you know, guaranteed minimum income because this is going to be a problem. The, the AI is coming after everybody's job. If anybody thinks it's not, even a highly, you know, human job like nursing, it's going to come after that kind of thing. You're going to have a robot doing the, 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 you know, the rounds on patients soon, right? So, so you're touching on a lot, um, a lot of interesting topics here. Um, <laughs> you, you had mentioned or like alluded to the concept of humans working with AI, right? And, yeah. and I'm curious in your opinion, are we going to reach a point in time where we actually integrate hardware into our bodies so yes. that we can work with the artificial intelligence at a higher, more efficient level? And if yes. so, when? Now, people are already getting it. If you have a hearing problem, you're getting cochlear implants, they're putting sensors into your brain. And that's it. If you have Parkinson's, they're already putting an electrode in your brain. And if your hands shake uh, because you have Parkinson's, you can't hold a cup of water or something like that, and can't feed yourself, can't wipe yourself in the in the bathroom, well, then you go to the doctor and say, "Man, I, my life sucks. I can't I can't do anything. My hands are always shaking." Well, they put an electrode in your brain and they turn it on, and your hands stop shaking, right? I've met the surgeons who do that. They say, well, now we have a discussion with the patient, like how many wires do you want on your brain? You need one. We're going in there to put one in, but do you want four? <laughs> do you want eight? <laughs> right. you know? right. Do you want a neural link soon with 32,000 wires on your brain? Yeah, yeah, we can hook you up. We can give you some new features, you know, <laughs> improve your life. You're, you're talking about um, medical types of benefits that come. But, but if, if I had some sort of a physical implant just for my daily li life for utility purposes, where, where do you think that could lead? The problem is that surgery is $150,000 and it comes with a lot of side effects because first of all, you're cutting somebody's head open. You're you know putting a quarter inch hole in their skull and then you're having a robot go in and put a bunch of wires down on your brain. That it was not something that normal everyday people are going to sign up for today. Uh, first of all, normal everyday people don't have 150 grand lying around to do this. And second of all, they don't want to sign up for the side effects. There's ways to do some of this on the outside of your head, right? I have a device from a company called NextMind, which puts a bunch of sensors on the back of your head, presses them against your skin, and then it can sort of tell what you're looking at because the back of your head is where you do all your visual processing. So like I'm looking at you right now, all that processing is being done at the back of your head. And if you have a bunch of electrodes back there with AI, it can sort of start figuring out what am I looking at? That's pretty wild. So do you anticipate um, a situation where there's the haves and the have-nots a, maybe a, a greater divide in society because yes. for a hundred and fifty thousand dollar surgery, a lot of people in in the upper echelons of society that wouldn't even think twice about it. And if that's going to improve their performance, their quality of life, their ability to earn, let's not go why to the grotesque. You know, are you going to get Neuralink? Let's talk about Apple headset. Apple headsets coming in in April next year, and it's around uh, thirty five hundred dollars, right? That that is not affordable by a lot of people in society. I mean, I, out of the eight billion people on the earth, how many people can afford a thirty five hundred dollar computing device? There's plenty, but there's a very small number in terms of eight billion people, right? But but I don't think that was Apple's um, objective at this first stage, right? I think they're okay no, with they hitting. They know that the price will come down, you know, over right. the next decade, and that ten years from now, most people are wearing glasses. Augmented reality glasses are a superpower. If you want to fly an F-35 fighter jet, you have to put on the augmented reality device they make, right? That gives the pilot a whole lot of superpowers. Right. And right. the same thing is going to come to your boardroom. If your CEO has a pair of these glasses on, he can see your sale or she can see your sales in a whole different way than you can. Can look at your uh, data lakes now, right? You know, if you work at a bank, you have petabytes of data going through your system. It can let you see that data in a new way. It gives you superpowers at work 
And you're absolutely right. If you have the glasses on, you're going to be more productive than if you don't have the glasses on. Access to real-time data, access on. to historic references, right? And and if my colleague doesn't have that ability, I win every time. Yeah. yeah. Right? So it's yeah, interesting yeah, when, you, when you- PR showed me that. They showed me uh, ability to see data in 3D laying th- like on the factory floor. She She showed me a factory floor where instead of looking at a spreadsheet of each machine's performance, I could actually look at the machine and it would tell me, right? That lets me see patterns in data that I just couldn't see before. So when you talk about spatial, like you're, you're getting into the spatial computing, uh, obviously, uh, conversation. And I, I read the report that you did surrounding Apple Vision Pro. It was very insightful. Something that really caught my attention is when you, when you look at Apple, versus Meta and Zuckerberg's approach, which is really heavy on on VR. This concept that you started describing, which was transition will beat revolution. The transition applies to Apple's spatial computing, whereby the revolution is what Meta is doing as it relates to VR. So can you take a second and and talk a little bit about about why you I, I assume you're saying you're betting on on Apple in, in the short term as it relates to spatial uh, uh, Zuckerberg will have some fun with a Quest Three, right? Um, the problem is he he doesn't have a lot of AI inferencing, uh, 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 you know, because he's using a, a Qualcomm chipset in his headsets, and the GPU in that Qualcomm chipset, which is really a, a an Android f- phone stuck on your head, right? Um, the GPU is about one half the pr- power of an Apple GPU in an Apple phone. So right there, they're behind on the ability to do AI inferencing. So what's about to happen in society is we're about to get uh, 3D environments that are photorealistic that are generated by AI, right? NERFs, neural radiance fields, they call them, or Gaussian splats. You're about to get virtual beings that are completely generated by AI. You're talking to chat GPT through a, a thing that's standing here in the room, right? Or, or on your screen. And those are virtual beings. Those are about to come. And they're coming a lot. I'm watching a lot of companies building these. Um, and there's a few other things coming as well. All of that requires AI inferencing. Now, Mark Zuckerberg has a problem because Apple has a phone. Apple can put a lot of GPU and uh, antennas and CPU and battery down in the phone and run a a pair of glasses with the phone, right? And do a lot of AI stuff on the the phone as well as on its ecosystem because Apple has um, a new radio network that nobody knows about called Ultra Wideband. And that can let your glasses talk to the M1 in your Macintosh that I'm talking to you on. In the Macintosh, the M1 processor that I'm talking to you on, 21% of that is neural network. It's not being used right now. The conversation me and you are having on my computer is not using that piece of the chip at all, but there's a lot of AI inferencing sitting there. So it can run all these new kinds of things on the Apple ecosystem that Mark Zuckerberg doesn't have. So he has to put everything in the cloud. He has to put all the AI inferencing on an NVIDIA card up in a data center somewhere and shove the results down to your glasses and keep the glasses lightweight. Well, that shows you a difference in philosophy on privacy, on latency, uh, all sorts of things. Because if the AI inferencing is being done either on your headset or on the phone in front of you or on the computer around you, it never leaves the house. Right. Now think about, you know, I was playing VR uh, the other day and that thing has, you know, four cameras that are facing at the at the room. It's doing uh, a lot of work to figure out, how, you know, where the room is around you. Um, well, my wife walked into the room naked. Where did that AI inferencing get done? Right. You have to think about that now. And in Apple's ecosystem, it's done in the house. It never leaves the house. Never leaves your head, really. So that localized power that you're talking about protects the individual's privacy and I would imagine can also create a much more powerful experience as it relates to 
the immersion or the the illusion of the immersion as well as the optic experience as well too i I have a list of ai artists and they're using ai tools to create art by talking to it in english right and so they'll say i want a purple tree and boom out comes a purple tree right you soon you're going to be in an environment where the system is doing that for you. So how, how far is, away are we though, Robert? Like, is it imminent? Uh, Do you think far, it will happen like a year? in a year? So, yeah. so when you Next talk Christmas, about, you're you, going to see a lot of this, what I'm talking about by Christmas 24. Yeah. And certainly by Christmas 25, then you're seeing a whole lot of new devices, a whole lot of new AI things, a whole lot of new uh, 3D environments, and a whole new way to compute. So um, it's going to require, though, a ton of innovation and creation on the software side, too. Oh, yeah. Yep. That's why they're spending these billions and billions of dollars on these AI companies, because they know that when they get to the promised land of everybody's wearing glasses, talking to virtual beings and talking to 3D environments that are changing, which sounds sort of weird. You're going to be doing this even in the street, you know? Hey, hey, uh, hey, Siri, can you tur- turn the night into day? And it, your glasses will, right? That's an AI that does that. That's a neural radiance field that appears on the real world and turns your nighttime into day, right? So how will the neural radiance fields benefit our community? Like what, what value is there? Like there's the entertainment factor, of course, right? Like my imagination is going wild right now. All of a sudden I'm finding myself, you know, in the middle of a safari that I've been wanting to take my entire life and I haven't had the chance to, I see great educational opportunities. I'm at, you know, center field for the NFL Super Bowl. like incredible, incredible things. But from a utility perspective, where what is the the role of a nerf? Like, how does that come into play? Let's say you're standing at uh, Glacier Point in Yosemite National Park. You're looking down at the valley. Uh, you know, Half Dome is over here. El Capitan's over there. Yosemite Falls is right in front of you. Why would you put on these glasses there? Right. Well, it'll tell you all the mountain ranges around you. You put on the glasses, you see all the mountain ranges. That's cool. You take off the glasses, maybe you see a, a little bit more analog, but you put the glass back on, you see mountain ranges. Then you look at the sky above you and say, hey, hey, uh, you know, Google, can you change the sky to the Hubble telescope view? And it does. Or can you tell me what that star is above my head? You know, oh, that's not a problem. We have apps that do that on our iPhones right now. They're just, just not put together very well. So even in a beautiful place, you're going to be getting a lot of utility out of these kinds of AIs, glasses that can do things for you. You know, hey, look at the uh, at the tree. What kind of what's the scientific name for that tree? There's an app on the iPhone that already does that. It just pain in the ass to use. What does it do, Robert? As it relates to something, this is a topic that's been um, on my mind for a while. What does it do as it relates to? like Western university education. Like the, mm-hmm. I, I think there's going to be some sort of a rebalancing effect internationally now in markets, you know, the outskirts of India where, you know, there's a super intelligent, creative, curious individual, but they could never go to Stanford because they don't have the financial means, but they could even go further now. Like not only can they access the information that you're talking about through AI, through spatial computing, but I would imagine they could even just look at their phone and, and run their, a new business off of it. So like, do you envision a, set, a kind of reset on the international landscape? And will yeah. Western universities, will we need that same level of education in the future? I, I think you still need education. I, I mean, if you look at Stanford and why, why parents are spending uh, you know, $70,000 to send their kids there for a year, right? There's a few reasons. One, they have a half billion dollar machine underneath the freeway to play with, right? That's really hard to put, you know, to take to other places in the world. You got to come to so you want to use that machine, which takes pictures of really small structures and does material science. You got to yeah. be at Stanford. There's no other alternative. Now, could they virtualize that so that you could use a uh, a simulation of that machine from your own home? Absolutely. Right. That costs money, though, and takes some time. I, I don't know that that's going to happen. And there's some advantage of having your machine, your actual students 
at the machine, understanding how it does, works and maybe even doing some tweaks to the machine so that they get better pictures out of the materials that they're trying to take a p- picture of. They, they take pictures of you know, uh, silicon and uh, other materials, real small materials, because that's the that that is the ground. That's why Silicon Valley is in Silicon Valley is that machine, right? And that's why the Silicon Valley ain't gonna move nowhere else because the freeway. There's a machine that's a mile long underneath our freeway that costs half a billion dollars, and there's two of them in that building now, right? They just put but that's them hardware. Down. But that's that's why you go to Stanford University, right? Right. That's why you want your kids to go to Stanford University, because if your kid is a hot-ass physicist or a material scientist, they get to go and play with that machine and learn a new skill and build a new company and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, like what if you're in the finance department? Like, do we need to go to Stanford for finance? Do we need to go to... Oh, well, okay. There Morton? we go. There right? we go. Now, there's another advantage of going to Stanford, because every kid you go into is either rich, right, or was grew up in poverty and worked their ass off to get into Stanford. So either way, you're sitting with interesting people around you and you go to the AI lab at Stanford, there's brilliant kids around you. I mean, yeah. really brilliant people, right? And, and so you're seems learning so that community from grows people. together too, right? Like I, I, I talk about a modern benefit of some of these very elite schools is the ongoing networking, the relationships. I think that's something yeah. that you would not be able to get if you're just in the comfort of your home. No, learning. see, now, now, now let's talk about how we would take that on, right? Because I've been yeah. in an app called Nanome in VR. This is a material scientist app. It uh, lets you see a chemical structure blown up as big as a house. So I, we were uh, walking around the COVID virus um, and they blew it up as big as my house and I could stick my head in the chemical structure and look around and I could see how it was built. I could see how the oxygen molecule connects to the carbon molecule, right? And I could actually click on each of those molecules and change it. And by the way, I was talking with scientists who were standing right next to me in VR. They weren't with me physically. They were somewhere else in the world, but we all met around this virus that, and we could all change its chemical structure interactively. We could high five each other even, right? In VR around this virus, around this chemical structure. So now they're teaching me about chemistry in a way that I would never be able to learn in a classroom. So how do American schools transform their curriculum, even at a young age, right? Even at like grade school to integrate these types of immersive experiences, artificial intelligence. I know you mentioned Stanford. Like I read a report recently that said an immersive experience, the the retention rate for individuals, it's actually a Stanford issued report. The, The retention rate for immersive experiences is much greater. I think it goes as high as 75% than being lectured at or reading. And um, yeah. I think in those situations, it's like five to 10% respectively. Yeah, Jeremy Bilenson at the Stanford VR group uh, lab uh, d- and his students did that research and they showed it, t- they showed, showed me, they gave me some examples. They put me in VR, they had me walking across a plank, right? And I knew this was coming because you can watch it on YouTube. You know, if anybody gets a tour of Stanford VR lab, you, you know the plank is coming, right? And, and you're sitting in a conference, you're standing in a conference room and, you know, you, before you put on your VR headset, yeah, you're in a normal conference room and there's three people standing around you that could catch you if you're falling or anything like that, right? So that's the rational part of your brain. And then you're, so they put you in VR and you're walking across this plank and then all of a sudden the floor falls away. So wow. I, I all of a sudden you're on a plank on you know and there and there's your mind is starting to go crazy because it thinks it's going to fall off this plank and into a, a canyon or something like that, right? You're not forgetting that. You're not forgetting that first of right. all. Your mind is freaking out in a way that 2D screens just cannot do. And right. three, you you come away with a memory of that that is real. It's the same as if you were on a real plank walking across a canyon. Your mind will also freak out, and it's going to be very memorable. It's the same. Whether you, whether you experience it virtually or experience it in real life, doesn't matter. Your mind absorbs that and, and remembers it the same way. So, Robert, is it just a matter of time until the United States government, like federal funding, 
vis-a-vis the Department of Education is investing in these technologies for our next generation? Because it seems like it's going to be super important. Here in New York City, I think 30% of New York City residents, in fact, did not have, do not have Wi-Fi. And yeah. um, obviously the impact is terrible, right? As you can imagine with, with learning from home during the COVID time period, it really had yeah. a, an adverse impact on our community. But it seems to me from what you're describing, it's not just about Wi-Fi now, it's access to hardware and access to all of this new technology if we're going to bring and everybody access to along. people. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. in the Nanome, in this chemistry app, I was talking to other scientists who were walking around with me. So if you're going to Stanford, uh, VR Stanford someday or a VR Harvard or something like that, you're going to be walking around, you know, a, a lab with with your professors and your other fellow students in VR. So it get, if you have one of the glasses, now you can go to Harvard in the future, right? But I understand the value, you, Robert. Sort of- I, I actually brought one of my classes at NYU into a VR experience with a scientist that works at NASA. He's been developing VR for 30 years. He met us from Cape Canaveral. We were right here in Midtown Manhattan, and he spent two hours with my entire class walking us through you know, all of these incredible innovations that are happening at NASA right now, without a doubt, that experience to me, it didn't feel like the the digital, the technology was a divide. It actually brought me closer to the scientist. I felt like yeah. a like a more human connection with him than I could have had on a telephone call or even if he was at the Think front of my what class we lecturing. Didn't do because of that. The that that astronaut or that administrator didn't have to fly in a plane, didn't have to get a hotel room. So uh, uh you know it's over time it's cheaper to do this kind of educate education in VR and it's much more capable. Plus you can bring it to people all over the world, right? Because everybody in the world can join you in your classroom, uh, you know, virtually if they have one of these headsets. There's a lot of change because of this coming to education. We all know it. We just don't know how it's all gonna happen. Because right now I'm not wearing a pair of these smart glasses, right? Is, is soon I will be. I mean, I have a pair. <laughs> I have a, I have a Hololens here, right? You know, so I could put put on my Hololens and go to town with you. But this is a thirty five hundred dollar device. It's ugly. It's not well supported. There's not a lot of software on here, right? And in five it's years, awesome. you're going to have a pair of lightweight glasses that's way, way more capable than this. So, is it fair to assume what you just described will also have a um, softer footprint on the planet? It would actually be beneficial as it relates to climate change. You're not flying as much, so you're not putting carbon in the air. Every time you fly, you're putting carbon in the air. You're causing climate change, right? And uh, uh, people haven't quite gotten that message yet, but they will. Uh, a few more cities burn down. And they're going to get that message that this is not a good thing to do for the environment. So let's stop doing it. Well, how do we stop doing it? How do we stop traveling? You got to get into new technologies. But it's hard, hard to explain that to people because right now that new technology looks like this, looks ugly and big and expensive, right? Well, in a decade, it's not going to be. It's going to be cheap and lightweight and very capable. So, What about going back to this concept you mentioned earlier about AI and robots? I know that you talk quite a bit about Tesla and autonomous vehicles. I anticipate it's only a matter of time until we see autonomous vehicles above us as well. But how far off are we as it relates to um, robots that are are trained and providing chores for humans and running errands for us, when when does that come into play? And do you know is your car even a car or is it a robot? My car is a robot. It drives me around town. I don't drive my car. It drives me. Right. I can take over and drive if I want. You know, if it's a curvy road on a sunny day and there's no traffic, no cops around, you know, it's fun to drive a little bit, right? But most of the time I'm in stop and go traffic, uh, taking the kids to school or going to some place in San Francisco or Silicon Valley, right? And there the car driving is fine. You're seeing the autonomous cars really cha- change pretty rapidly now. They're they're getting to the final stages of fixing every error that they have, right? And so you're seeing 
uh, GM Cruise driving around San Francisco and Google's Waymo company. Uh, Waymo spun out of Google or at Alphabet or whatever they call themselves now. <laughs> I, I, and I actually just read today Waymo. that Go- you mentioned these two companies. Like I read today that GM and Google just cut a deal and I believe GM is valuing the um, the relationship at about twenty five billion a year in subscri- new subscription revenue just by integrating the Google Cloud into its automotive fleet. The numbers are getting crazy because the data is getting crazy, right? My my Tesla is uploading uh, gigabytes per day to the Dojo and, and Nvidia Cloud that they have, right? Yeah, it's a new world. Uh, anyways, back to robots. Let's talk about robots. So this this uh, robot car is the first step. Uh, the second step is a humanoid robot. The car can go someday and pick up my humanoid robot and bring the humanoid robot to my house. Oh, welcome, Mr. Tesla robot. What can you do? Oh, Stanford has a robot that already does 1,600 tasks, like folding laundry, cleaning toilets, uh, playing games with you, doing the dishes, cooking dinner, right? Who doesn't want a robot like that? It's just right now, those kinds of robots uh, cost about $100,000 to, to, to sell you, right? Maybe 30000 to build. But there are only 26 little brushless electric motors and a computer. It doesn't cost that if you get to scale, right? So if they get these things to scale, like if Tesla could ever get to the place where they're making 10 million of these humanoid robots a year, the cost is going to go down to less than $5,000. And that's when we get the revolution. Right. And that that day is not far off. I, I originally thought it was 2026. Uh, Irina and I wrote a whole report about this humanoid robot and what's, what it's going to do to the Western home. But uh, Tesla just showed off an end-to-end system that trained itself how to drive just by watching videos. <laughs> right? So that's so, totally transformative, right? If, if it's just totally, by watching right? video, what type of an impact does that have on artificial intelligence? It speeds it up. So now I'm expecting the robot in 2025 instead of 2026. Now maybe it's still 2026, but it's somewhere in that range. Uh, a robot's going to come to your door and deliver your pizza, right? Once it does that, it's going to invite itself in. It's going to say, hey, you know, now that I'm here to, to deliver your pizza, uh, would you like me to come in and uh, set the table or do your dishes or clean your bathroom while you're eating your pizza? You know, I do a lot of things like, you know, and I can. And here's the secret. There's robots that mow lawns, blow your snow, clean your windows, vacuum your floors. Right. There's all sorts of robots. You go to the Consumer Electronics Show now and there's a hall, hall just of robots. Well, the humanoid robot can bring all those other robots to your house and charge you for them. Hey, you want your uh, snow blowed today? Uh, you know, that costs a hundred bucks. And we got a robot that does that. <laughs> it, it's pretty wild, Robert. And then when you go back and think about the impact on jobs, because there's, um, yeah. it seems to me like I'm in the camp of um, LLMs are really impacting uh, more of the the um, let's say the, the white collar jobs right now. Like I, I don't think the legal community realizes what they're about to be hit with with yeah. you know platforms like Harvey they AI. Do. I think the creative communities, etc. But what you're talking about as it relates to the robots is coming down to the blue collar jobs. So where yes. do you think people should be? Th- um, like, yeah. So where should people be heading as it relates to reskilling, as it relates to new job creation? They're going to be total like a, a slew of new jobs that I would imagine, new concepts that we can't even dream of today that are going to create the next phase of billionaires, the next I've talked phase to a lot of, of CEOs and I'm like, all right, let's say you, you have a thousand workers and you need to cut 10% of them. Do you cut the AI people first or at last? Of course, they cut the AI people last. They're the right. most productive people in your company. So 100%. that's the secret. Get to right. skilled on AI. Understand how the robots, you know, start doing projects with robots, right? And but most people don't think like this. That's but you see, you'll see like a subscription and- service, right? Like I could envision a Tesla subscription service for these um, what we're calling robots today that maybe they'll turn into AGI. Who knows, right? You, you yeah. never really know. But all of a sudden for my house, it's my housekeeper, my chef, my 
um, gardener, and it just goes on and on and on. Babysitter, nannies, like where does it where does it stop? It won't. It doesn't. It doesn't, man. Right. The, I'm already having conversations with my with OpenAI with ChatGPT, right? And it's really good at listening. I, it. it huh. I uh, worked with a psychiatrist who worked with a entrepreneur who built a listening system for herself for her psychiatry meetings. And we had a 30 minute conversation, a, a therapy session where, you know, we just had a conversation about what's going on in my life and what's my struggles, what's my mental challenges, where am I getting into fights with people, you know, what triggers me, that kind of stuff. And it listened to that 30 minute conversation and it wrote seven highly detailed technical notes for her uh, about me. And I posted them on x.com so you can go look at them. And it nailed all my mental illnesses in 30 minutes. So just by <laughs> listening to me talking, like it could be listening to me right now, talking to you and figuring out something new about me, right? Because it, it's analyzing this, listening to this, and then it'll tell Twitter, oh, this was a good good quote right here. <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> well, it's kind of interesting. So a white collar worker, right? Like yeah. in this case, you have a professional doctor and it could go even further, right? Because then for for you know, a baseline of illnesses, right? Like if I have the flu, do I need to go spend a ton of money in Manhattan to see my primary doctor? Or can I just, you know, get into a, a, a quick call with an AI and explain what my symptoms are? And then can the AI go ahead and write a, write a, a prescription for me? And, and can I just have a robot deliver it to my house? Like that doesn't seem so far-fetched. Doing that, prescribing and, and giving a detailed, you know, oh, you have the flu, and like telling you what you have, that's FDA uh, regulated. That does two things. So it, if you have an AI that does that, it has gone through a whole FDA process and it's a medical app. Uh, there's a lot of things they can do without doing that. Like, for instance, my friend is building a check engine light for human beings where it's just going to tell you, hey, you need to go to the doctor. I love that. <laughs> we, we can't tell you why, but you know, take your data, go to the doctor, and we'll tell the doctor what, what we're seeing in your heart condition or something like that. And the that. doctor is going to be the one that prescribes you. And I think that's going to be the way for a while. You know, but there's lots of places in the world that don't have good health care, right? There's 8 billion people in this world. Right. Right. So right. are they going to have a digital doctor? That, hell yes. Why not? Why not? And let, let me ask you this. So when you mention regulation, you know, maybe there's regulation as it relates to dispensing medic medicine, but, um, you know, obviously regulation of artificial intelligence is a big issue right now. I read a report this morning, yeah. in fact, on Axios that said, um, I think it was, a, it was a survey of academics, and they said, for the most part, they didn't believe that people, including President Biden, Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, really have the capabilities of handling these issues surrounding artificial intelligence. In fact, Biden led the pack as being the most trustworthy at 9%, just 9%. Altman was behind him. Trump was behind him. Zuckerberg, all of them. So do you think that the government that we currently have is even capable of fully understanding no. the concepts you're talking about and properly no. regulating? No. There's only a couple of people in the Senate who uh, can have a decent conversation with you about it, uh, about what we're talking about here. That's not where you're going to get good policy out of, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and this is a real problem because the, the Silicon Valley people, they're rapacious business people. They're seeing a, a way to make trillions of dollars, right? And so they're running full steam ahead. And the, the government just, first of all, even if there were confident people in the Senate, we're politically divided in the country. So we can't get together and decide to do anything. I mean, let's talk about just, you know, the jobless problem. If we were 
if we were run, you know, properly and we were getting along and we really were thinking about, you know, how do we take care of the problems that are coming, we'd be uh, building a GI bill or a, a guaranteed minimum income right now. And we'd be talking about that and we'd be talking about job retraining and we'd be talking about, you know, how do we take a truck driver out of truck driving in the next 15, 20 years uh, or five, <laughs> it's coming qu pretty quick. Um, how do we give him a, or her a fair shot at the American dream and, and get him back on the, you know, working, but we're not talking like that. It's a real problem. It's a real right. problem. We're, we're back in this presidential election cycle, right? Technically. And I haven't heard any politician or, or, you know, presidential candidate yet talk about these types of issues. No, cause they, nothing meaningful. They, they don't. They don't use this stuff the way I use it. I mean, I, you know, I use it for. I force myself to use it to understand what these large language models do, and they're very, very complex machines that are very interesting to use as human beings. I mean, it listened to my psychiatry therapy session and took notes. And if was that accurate. doesn't get your attention, nothing is. That's just right? incredible. It's incredible. You know, and, and they're using it on factory floors. I talked to a rocket engineer. He's talking about, you know, using it to to make the rocket engines more more uh, efficient and, and make it more controllable. So, Robert, what's the solution then? Like, why do we have to rely so much on politicians that just don't understand the technology? I mean, look what happened in Web3. We've literally, because of the uncertainty in defining whether or not something like ETH is a security, we've literally had a chilling impact on VC investment, PE investment, job creation. It's already gone overseas. Do you anticipate the same type of issue hitting us as it relates to this spurt of growth surrounding AI? I mean, if we stop AI uh, development here in Silicon Valley, let's say uh, no more AIs, uh, stop buying NVIDIA cards, can't do any model building. No, we got to slow that down. Uh, China's not thinking like that. They just spent $40 billion on their semiconductor industry. So you, you're going to put yourself at a disadvantage to China? I mean, here's an example of this. I was talking to Volkswagen. They have already digitized their entire factory floor, big, huge plant in Wolfsburg, Germany, right? They've already digitized that, turned that into a digital twin. And I, I was asking, well, uh, are you going to the next level? Are you putting 3D sensors on your factory floor, watching, you know, cameras or something, watching your workers work to have AI see a pattern, maybe it can find some in, more inefficiencies that you didn't even see, right? Because you're studying uh, the factory floor with AI. Oh, we can't do that in Germany. And there's rules against putting cameras on workers. In China, they don't do that. So they're in China, the factories are becoming more productive because they're using technology to make the factory more productive. And, you know, if you think that's going to work out for you it, as a country to stick your head in the sand and not and not use it, then you're going to gift your economy to China because they're using it and they're becoming more productive. Their, their factories are more productive than anybody else's factories because they use technology like this. Right. So so which politicians do you think understand that and can help America. Ed McKay, uh, you know, the problem is there's only one or two out of, you know, the hundreds of people who are running our government. The, the rest of them really don't understand at all. If, if any of them are listening to me, all I want you to do is force yourself to use AI for every question you have, any policy question, any anything. Force yourself to use it and see what it tells you because you're going to learn a lot about how it works. You're going to make better decisions, particularly if you say, show me all points of view, please, on X, right, on uh, using AI in factories. It'll tell you. The truth is, though, that going back to where we started our conversation, this fear of newness prevails. I had on the show... Um, a New York State Assemblyman, Clyde Vanell, he was the first person to write a bill using artificial intelligence. And he was attacked, Robert, from the landlords, from the tenants, from his political colleagues on both sides of the it fence, both happens. Democrat and Republican, and the media. And what he found was, naturally, he didn't just like hit a button and a bill was drafted. Like He had to apply 
his wealth of knowledge surrounding this landlord tenant issue and massage it and massage it and massage it. But what he found, which I think is super compelling, was that by using artificial intelligence to augment the bill writing process, he took a bill, he drafted the bill in about three hours. It normally would have taken it would have taken him about two to three weeks. And he was able to then allocate his time to help his constituency with other needs that they have in that gap of time where he made up, you know, he made up time for them. He was being more productive yeah. as, as a politician. But in fact, everybody pushed back against it. We banned snowboarding in Tahoe ski resorts. When I was a kid, Snowboarding was evil. It cut up the snow differently. The, those those kids were like the rebels. They were the troublemakers. Oh, we didn't want them around, right? Now it's an Olympic sport, right? Every time there's a new thing in human history, people resist. I wish they wouldn't, but they do. But with artificial intelligence, the genie is out of the bottle, and you're not. Nobody could put it back in. We're we're you know we're way past the idea of trying to to slow it down. To your point, capitalism, politics, they're all pushing everything forward. So it's just not going to happen. It's not going to slow down. No, I totally agree with that. It's, it's, it's going to speed up, in fact. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. Just a fun exercise um, because I love, you know, you have such an impressive um, history and background as it relates to truly being a part of the tech industry. Um, if Steve Jobs was around today, what do you think he would be thinking as it relates to artificial intelligence and spatial computing? What would Steve Jobs want? He liked the idea of a computer that humans uh, could use better, right? He, he was all about making the humans more, more powerful, more, more productive, more creative, right? Um, he would not like the new, the, the latest LLMs because they hallucinate or they confabulate, uh, answers. In other words, here's an example. I was in uh, Austin restaurant. I used chat GPT. Hey, chat GPT. Uh, what should I eat at this restaurant? And it gave me six items, four of which were amazing. They were right on point. I ate them all. They were great. Two were never on the menu. It made them up. And I, you know, we can talk about why, but it made him up. And this is a real problem. Steve Jobs hated ugliness. He hated incorrectness. He hated that kind of problem. So he would be asking his engineers to solve that problem before they shift it. And that's sort of what's going on. You, you're not seeing Apple being first to ship an LLM because that it has these problems, right, of confabulation, error generation, um, and other, other things, bias and stuff like that, right, ugliness. He wants to see some of that, most of that cleaned up before it gets into a product. Do you think if Steve Jobs was with us today and he was in an artificial intelligence war against Elon Musk, Jobs would win? He's the only person who got Siri. He uh, bought the first AI app. So you would so bet yeah, on Jobs? Yeah, he would get it. I yeah, he, he understood how human beings work and what, what's important. When he sees a new thing coming along that's going to make a better product, he would be excited by it. But he would want to make sure that it doesn't bring problems to people. Because, you know, if, if his AI on your iPhone is lying to you and making shit up, that's not good for the brand, right? Do you think that um, artificial intelligence can ultimately assist us with social issues, um, social justice topics, gender equality, racism, anti-Semitism? Do you think at the end of the day, it's going to be, it's going to help us come together? Mm. That's up to us, right? If you have a curious people who ask lots of questions, we're going to get along fine and we're going to be led to a, a better place. Because if you ask AI, please show me all points of view on racism or on gender inequality, it has really good answers. But you have to ask the question in that way. You have to ask for all points of view. You can't ask it to uh, back you up and, and make your point of view stronger. Because that's what most people do. They, they, don't, they are tribal. They, they want things that agree with them. 
right? If, the, if you're going to a Christ, into a church or something like that, you build a point of view, a worldview, and you don't like things that that attack that worldview. So most people don't ask questions like that. But if you did, the answers are all there. What about taking the concept a little further as it relates to social justice? Um, you know, it seems like forever slavery has been on this planet, and including certain pockets and regions today. And it comes down to labor. And what you were talking about earlier is that, you know, robots can do manual labor. Do you think that will ever have a, a situation. strawberry out of a field just like a human can right, far faster right. by the way and far cheaper but the, que- but the question complain. is like will it ever be applied right like can in in areas like china where you hear about like the uyghur issue and and slavery there like chinese is ahead of the curve obviously they have not just resources but capital will they replace let's say slavery with robots and ai <sighs> Will they finance that or just keep the humans down? Um, I would say increasingly over time, technology is going to do more and more things that we used to do as work. Start with the high value, high, high cost jobs. So the poor people in China will be the last ones to get affected, I predict. But I, I don't know. You know, it, you're seeing John Deere building a lot of robots that's doing a lot of farming around the world, right? And that used to be done by humans, teams of people, you know, uh, going out in the field and digging ditches and planting things and harvesting them and stuff like that. Now a lot of that's being done by robots, at, at least in the richer places in the world. And yeah, it's coming after everybody. I, you know, I, that's a tough question for me to answer because it's over my pay grade. <laughs> I, I don't I think about it. the poor people it. in China very often. Right? Sure. Well, I what, can tell what about you what the rich the... people in America are doing because that's where well, I am. Well, let's talk about that for a second because you know we our cities are really powerful. New York City is incredible, but is the infrastructure built to optimize and support robotics, um, artificial intelligence? In the near term, do you think the concept of cities will change because of all of yes. these technologies? And, and you'll see certain great let's, cities, like even New York City, dying? Let's not go crazy with a humanoid robot. Let's just talk about autonomous cars. Autonomous cars are going to change New York deeply. But are we built? Is our infrastructure capable of supporting it? Like right now, short term, certainly we won't have the ability to charge. We don't have maybe the ability to free up the streets. Did you know that um, autonomous vehicles are illegal in New York State? I didn't. It's true. You can't yeah, drive in change. autonomous. Yeah. But in New York, like that'll that's- change. And you know why it'll change? Because two of my high school friends were killed in car wrecks. And how many more tragedies do we need in our society before people get a clue and make that legal? If in San Francisco, they never die, the kids in San Francisco never die because they have autonomous cars. And if you go to San Francisco right now, uh, like every third car is an autonomous car. I see it. Right? Yep. You think the voters in New York are going to put up with their kids getting slaughtered on the roads because their uh, their politicians are backwards? It's an interesting that's tension. Going to last very long, right? Because human error. No, you know, I mean, let's talk it like a human to human. You want your kids to go get slaughtered on the road because you're backwards and trying to keep things the way they were. Forty thousand people in America get killed in car wrecks. So you think that's acceptable? And Mr. Politician or Mrs. Politician, you think that's acceptable to tell your people that live in your state that that's acceptable, that you shouldn't be going after and changing that? That dooms you to being a, a, a city w- with less productivity because autonomous cities are going to be way more pro- productive than a human-run city, and it's going to slaughter people. You you want that as a politician? You see how long that lasts because people do get a clue after a while. I agree. I agree. And then they vote differently, right? Hopefully. 
seems like in these big no, cities, they do. Eventually, we're voting the you same know, we, way as it relates to- We do change to- in America. It, it takes a lot of yelling and screaming. You know, in the 1950s, we had whites-only counters, right? Uh, yeah. You know, and just a few years ago, I walked around Greensboro, North Carolina with the first black mayor who stopped me in front of the Woolworths where the kids sat at the whites-only counter just a few decades ago. So we do change in America. It's just a lot of noise, a lot of yelling and screaming and resistance to change. You think ultimately we'll end up in the right spot? I think so. I think we're going to go in a better direction. We'll have some new problems to worry about. I I keep sharing, you know, like, hey, there's new security problems with these large language models, right? That's a new problem and somebody has to solve. So, Robert, we've had you for a long time. What what our guests do, and I think you're going to be like the best at this, honestly, because (laughs) of your perspective. Um, At the end, we... Remember, the show is called Some Future Day. And and what we do is we kind of lead. I've created like three concepts to lead you into finish the sentence, right? So um, if you don't mind real quickly, the first one is on some future day, AI will create a world where humans and robots will. Humans and robots. Someday we're going to merge. That's the singularity, right? When you have Neuralink on your brain, aren't you merged with AI? And aren't you working with the AI as a partner all the time? You know, and, and and you don't even need to go that crazy. When you get, you know, Apple Glasses version three, you know, in 2026, it's going to do most of that already. On some future day, AI will create economic wealth for... Elon Musk. <laughs> a lot of it. <laughs> Unfortunately. And we need to talk about that, right? If you're going to create somebody who is a trillionaire, right? And we're talking about billionaires are nasty for society. We shouldn't allow that. And Elon could be a trillionaire someday or somebody like an Elon, right? And that's a real problem uh, for society. To, to have that much wealth inequality is a real problem, you know? On some future day, Apple's spatial computing will improve the world because... It'll let you see yourself in a new way. I love that. It'll let you travel to places you can't afford to go. It'll let you go to classrooms that you can't uh, get access to. I mean, I, it's funny. Uh, MC Hammer and I were teaching a class at Stanford, went to the business school. And we, before the class, we turned out to each other and goes, damn, they would never let us into this place. <laughs> 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 you know? <laughs> right? I love that. <laughs> didn't That's have amazing. the grades, didn't have the right skin color. You know, there was a lot of reasons that they wouldn't invite us in. But amazing. Here we are. That's about to change. You're going to be able to, your kids are going to be able to get access to things that whether they have, you know, a lot of money or not a lot of money, they're going to have access to things that they, that only the kings had access to just a generation ago. It's kind of interesting if you think about it. If artificial intelligence creates a lifestyle, you mentioned the kings, where perhaps people don't have to, you know, do brutal work all day long and they could spend more time concentrating on things they love, their family, hobbies, being curious, learning and educating, being entrepreneurial, maybe the world will shift um, in ways we can't even imagine. And and perhaps that's why yeah. your recurring theme of um, a universal basic wage or income will be important because um, yeah. Apparently, I think we need you- a new GI Bill first because my dad grew up in poverty in Brooklyn, right? And he took our family out of poverty by going to the army for a few years. And then they gave him a GI Bill so that they would pay for his schooling. And he got a PhD from Rutgers University in New York and then got moved to Silicon Valley, you know, which was called Silicon Valley back then in 1971, right? And he took our family out of poverty because of that. But he had to have the wealth to be able to go to school for five years or six years, right? right. That's a lot of, that's hard for a lot of people. Particularly now, I mean, if you want to go to, if you get accepted to Stanford, that's the first thing people do as a family is like, uh, how do we afford to send you to Stanford for, it costs $70,000 a year. So four years is quarter million dollars. That's 
not easy for a lot of people to come up with. Most. Most. By far. Right? Yeah. So now you have to think about, you know, how, how do you get funding for that? How do you get a, you know, a grant or a, a you know, a sponsor? <laughs> yeah. What do you call yeah. that? <laughs> so, Robert, I really appreciate all of your time today. It's really been a thrill to meet you and um, your insight and, and vision is incredible. So thank you. Thanks. But yeah, if I had one plea, you know, let's work on a new guarantee. Not, I don't like the guaranteed minimum income. I, I understand that's going to be needed for a lot of people. So we should not take it off the table. But, you know, I don't like that. I, our Native American reservations, they have a, a form of that guaranteed minimum income. And those places are not real fun to be at. There's a lot of alcoholism, a lot of hopelessness because there's just no hope. There's no change. There's no nothing new, no, nothing for them to do. They're stuck. And I don't like that for humans. That's not a good place for humans to be. Well, this is a whole other conversation I'd love to get into you, into with you, like as it relates to like um, individualism, capitalism, and Rand type of stuff you know this is this is important stuff while we've been talking i've been watching this ai art list i made i, I made a list of all the ai artists on x.com and it's just going crazy so people are uh, taking their extra time because their robots are doing their work right and they're and they're using ai art programs to create their their visions of what they want to create and put it up on x.com and it's, it's amazing. coming out at a fast clip yeah is is that list Posted somewhere? Can can yeah, we reference? I just, posted, um, I just made actually, that why don't last you mention you you, list, you mentioned two lists while we were talking? Do you want to tell the audience yeah. where they can where they can find these lists? And and if you go um, to your, if you go to the thing that used to be called Twitter X dot com and go to my profile and then go view lists, you'll see all my lists. I have lists on investors and founders and journalists and world news and tech news and and AI art. Cool. <laughs> and, uh, awesome. <laughs> All and right, AI man. companies is another one that's really crazy too. Yeah. I know your time is very important. So thank you so much for joining me today. For ongoing insights surrounding these important topics, you can join the conversation on my social media channels, including Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Mark Beckman. And to sign up for my newsletter on Substack, you can find me at markbeckman.substack. Com. To make sure you don't miss a show, be sure to subscribe to Some Future Day across all major platforms worldwide, including YouTube, Spotify, and Apple. Special thanks to New York University for producing Some Future Day, and a big shout out to my producer extraordinaire, John Boomhofer, for being patient and always encouraging me to push through. Thanks a lot, John. Have a great day.